Welcome to Hope Channel International. Do you think Christians should stay away from non-believers at all costs? This video has some interesting insight on how to live a Christian life the way God would want us to. What are those challenges for the Israelites? What's going on in this story? Well, it's a, and it's an attempt to change the identity. Okay. Yeah, it's an attempt to change the identity. If you look at the names, we know that in biblical times, names carry the character of right. a person. It's not just a label that you think sounds pretty. You're hoping when you name a child that they'll reflect the character in that name. Right? God says that's important. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save my people from their sins. Names right. had meaning and hopefully denoted what your child would become. These names are important. Absolutely they are. And when you think about the names of Jesus, Emmanuel, you think of, uh, you know, the Prince of Peace, you know, the Morning Star. All of these names suggest not only his character, but also his mission. And I think that that's also what's happening here is they, uh, the Babylonian king is saying, well, I want to give you a new character. Um, you know, Daniel's name goes from Daniel to Belteshazzar. And Daniel, we talked about this a little bit. You know, his name is uh, to God. Uh, oh, God is my judge. God is my judge. Right. And that Belteshazzar... Belteshazzar is the carrier of the bells. So, you know, yeah. I mean, it's... And Bel being a Babylonian god. I absolutely. Mean, he's been renamed from the god of Israel to, and the king is obviously hoping, hey, we're going to change him. He's, he's marking him. This man is no longer going to be a, god, a follower of Jehovah. He's going to be a follower of Bel. Of Bel. And, and the rest of the names follow in that line. Each of them are named after a particular god. And so here they are in Babylonian territory, and uh, they're trying, the Babylonian king's trying to give them a new identity on all lever, levels. I mean, think about this, Sean. They're going to be trained for three years. So not only are they going to speak the language well, but they're also going to be thinking uh, like a Babylonian. Uh, at least that was the hope. You know, it's interesting there because we, we said before the break, this is relevant in the year 2012. And I, I didn't go to college in 2012. I'd hate to tell you when I did go. It wasn't the 50s. But it I'm wasn't, not sure about that, Sean. No, it's about <laughs> halfway between the 50s and now. But I didn't go to a Christian college. I mean, I wasn't particularly a believer at that stage of my life. Uh, I was struggling with belief. And I often think about Christian young people who have to set foot on a secular campus. It's not that much different. Three or four years of facing different kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. The challenge that Daniel faced, we're still facing today, particularly young people. We are, uh, Sean, and that's what, the reason why I like this story about Daniel, um, because he goes on to say to the king uh, and to his official, particularly Ashpenaz, uh, that wonderful name there, um, he goes on to tell him, I, I cannot defile myself with the portion of the king's food. And, and I, when, I, when I read Daniel saying this, it, to me it encapsulates how we are to live in the world. You know, you're supposed to be in the world but not of the world. Right. And so Daniel is saying, well, listen, I'm here. I'm not, he didn't say I'm not going to be part of this kingdom. He didn't say I'm leaving it. He said, I'm just going to operate according to the morals and the ethics that I know God would be pleased with. And so you can still be within an environment that may not totally be godly and yet be godly yourself. And I think that's the example that Daniel sets for us. I, I think that's pretty important because I've, I, there have been Christians through the centuries and still Christians today who say the only way to survive in this world is to check out, and they disappear, form a cloister, hide in the woods, never set foot in society, and yet that's not the job Jesus gave us. Um, you know, it's really interesting to me. I mean, Jesus tells us to be a light. He tells us to be the salt of the earth. Mm -hmm. He tells us to be of an influence, to show people God's character. That was really the job that Israel had been given to do. You were to be a light to the Gentiles, and they'd failed miserably, miserably. at that. As a, as a matter of fact, it went the other way. Right. The Gentiles had been darkness to them and they, they absorbed it. Right. Now, here are some of the brightest and best given a chance to really shine and demonstrate how it's done in very adverse circumstances. They absolutely are, Sean. And, and the thing that I like about God is that when we stand up for Him, He gives us an unimaginable amount of grace and strength and power to sustain us while we're standing for him. You know, Hebrews 7.25 says, you know this verse very well, you know, therefore he is able to completely save right. those who come to him. And so when we come to God and we stand for him, then he saves us. We normally think of being saved as redemption, and it is. We're lost, God finds us. But also saving is preservation. 
Right. So there's redemption and preservation going on here. They make the choice to stand for God and he redeems them. That's cool. But then also now while they're in the midst of this Babylonian culture, this ungodly environment, he's also going to preserve them because they've made a stand to come to him and to, to, to make his name great in Babylon.